Okay, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, this program is uh, put on by the Tufts Lawyers Association. Uh, I'm the president of the Tufts Lawyers Associ Association. My name is Tom Dunn. I'm a partner at Pierce Atwood in uh, Boston, Massachusetts and Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, TLA is a uh, 501c3 nonprofit uh, shared interest group of Tufts. Um, we're in independent from Tufts, but also partner with a lot of other shared in interest groups at Tufts. We have regional groups um, in various cities and, and areas, uh, one in New England, one in New York, uh, one in DC, and one on the West Coast. If you wanna learn anything about Tufts, you can visit us on our website or our social media. You can shoot me an email um, and uh, I'm happy to, to reach out to you. Um, we do have a couple of upcoming programs that Amy McDonald from Tufts is gonna to put into the uh, chat room. Well, we have one coming up from our uh, public interest and social justice uh, committee on November 9th um, on um, gender-based violence. Uh, that's going to be, I believe, at uh, 6 p.m. And then we have uh, the next uh, program of our Tufts Judicial Series uh, with uh, Judge R. Guy Cole of the Sixth Circuit, uh, recently uh, stepped down as being the Chief Judge of the Sixth Circuit. Um, that's going to be on December 1st. Uh, that Those have been a really fun programs to attend. I, I I uh, hope you can, can make it. Um, now on, on today's program, uh, which is Jumbo Lawyers Around the World, um, Practicing Abroad as an American Lawyer. Uh, Dan Mandel came to me a few um, months ago with this program concept and, and we worked it together. Uh, Dan has put together a fabulous panel of uh, speakers from Switzerland, Japan, and Israel to um, to give us perspective on what it's like to practice abroad, uh, to be an attorney uh, abroad. Uh, Dan is a 2005 graduate, uh, political science economics major. Uh, he ha received his JD and LLM from uh, Georgetown in 2010. Um, recently, earlier this year, uh, he was legal counsel to the office of the president of the Republic of Palau. And, um, is interested in international practice. And Dan, thank you for your energy and involvement in putting this program together. I can't wait to uh, to see how it is. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. As we have people joining us from all around the world, we are, I think, quite literally in every time zone. Uh, as Tom mentioned, my name is Daniel Mandel. I am a 2005 Tufts undergraduate. Uh, I need to correct one thing. I'm actually a Duke Law grad, not a Georgetown Law grad. Um, for anyone who knows the rivalry between those two schools will understand why that is an important clarification. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm really excited that we were able to put together this program and that I can moderate it this morning because it's really uh, just a, something that's personally interesting to me. So I hope that you all enjoy it as well. Um, but uh, as a, someone who's interested in international law and practicing abroad, uh, I think it's always really interesting to get the uh, insights from people who have made the leap uh, across one of our oceans uh, from the hill uh, to the rest of the world. And as Tom mentioned, I actually just did that myself. I was in the Republic of Palau for two years, uh, working as legal counsel in the office of the president. Uh, so today, we really have put together a global panel um, to share with everyone what it's like to practice law abroad as an American trained lawyer. I'm going to start with introductions by heading in the eastern direction from the hill, our, our communal uh, starting point. Um, first, we have Mr. Edward Flaherty, class of 1981. He's the founder and senior partner of Schwab Flaherty and Associates uh, in Geneva, Switzerland. And then continuing eastward, we have Janet Pahima, class of 1980. She's a partner with the law firm of Herzog Fox and Neiman in Israel. And then third, uh, coming to us from Tokyo, Japan, we have Geraldine Fisher, class of 1999. She's currently legal counsel with a case management team at the International Center for the Settlement of Dispute Investment Disputes, which is commonly known as ICSID. And we have a lot to discuss over this next hour. Uh, what I've done is I've divided our discussion into three parts. First, I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to spend a few minutes explaining how they got from the Hill uh, to their current positions abroad. And then we're going to discuss everyone's experiences, especially focusing on what challenges they've encountered, what opportunities they see, what types of things they wish they had known along the way, uh, which for those of us who aren't there yet is something that we would all very much like to know. Uh, 
And then finally, we want to open up the floor to questions. I know that everyone has a different perspective, is interested on hearing different things. So we definitely want to hear what things you would like to know more about. To ask questions, you can type them into the Q&A box down at the, the bottom of the screen. Um, and then uh, Tom is going to uh, read them out for us when we get to there. So uh, without any further ado, I want to start. Um, let's first start by heading over to Switzerland. Um, Edward, if you could start telling us a little bit about how you got to where you are now. Great, great. Thanks, Dan and Tom, and to, to uh, Geraldine and Janet as well. It's a great privilege and honor to participate in, in the forum today. Uh, as Stan said, I graduated in 81 from, from Tufts. Uh, I was a commuter student. I, I uh, grew up uh, five miles from Tufts. Uh, didn't even know it existed at the time, but ended up there anyway. And uh, had always, uh, from, a, from a young age, actually, I, I'd always been interested in the law because my father had been a policeman in Boston. And uh, he certainly didn't want me to become a policeman. So the next best thing, I guess, was to, to uh, pursue the law. And uh, uh, because I was uh, a commuter student and local, when I graduated from Tufts, I went immediately to Suffolk University Law School, which is uh, where many of the Boston politicians uh, go, go to law school at night. I actually was a day student for for in the beginning uh, and then continued to work uh, in a law firm, small law firm uh, in Burlington, Mass for two years while I was uh, finishing school, working for a conveyancing firm. And when I graduated, uh, I ended up uh, starting a partnership pretty much right out of, as soon as I passed the bar in uh, Salem, Massachusetts. And, and it was a commercial practice. We were uh, doing, representing small and medium-sized businesses doing uh, different types of, of commercial work. And, and it, it continued to grow. And one of the things I, I never intended to do was ever to go into a courtroom. I, I thought my moot court experience in my first year in law school would be the first and last time I ever went into a courtroom. But uh, as many of you already know, and, and, the, and the law students who are out there will, will learn, it never goes in, your, your career never goes in sort of a straight uh, trajectory. And uh, during my 10 years in, in, uh, in Massachusetts, I progressively started to do more court work. And towards the end of my, my 10 years, we, we uh, were retained by the National Credit Union Administration to help them with a, a number of things, uh, foreclosures, things of, of that nature. But I, uh, so I ended up doing much more uh, litigation. At that point, um, I'd been married and my wife was, uh, had been offered a job in Paris and uh, well, she was doing an internship in Paris and then they offered her a full-time position and she came back to me and said, do you want to, do you want to move, move to Paris? And I'd been a lawyer for 10 years. I was sick of my partner. I was sick of my clients. I was sick of other lawyers. And this was back in, you know, 1992, 93, we, we had PCs and the, the beginnings of email, but back then everything, every cover your ass letter that you had to send, uh, you had to type out. Uh, yourself and sign. So it took an awful lot of time and I was very sick of that. So uh, I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll love to go to Paris. And uh, by the time I arrived, uh, it took me about six months to, to uh, sell my, pra my practice to my partner and wrap up my cases. Um, I arrived and I learned that my wife's uh, job, at, which was at the International Chamber of Commerce in Paris, uh, was being, uh, her unit was being merged with a similar organization in Geneva. And so I had a six month sabbatical in Paris. Um, and then we moved to Geneva. Uh, one, one little side note to that is I was, when I uh, enrolled at Tufts, I had I'd taken French from a, a, a fairly young age. So I placed out of most of it, except I had to do one semester. So I did my, uh, my language requirement in my first semester freshman year. Of course, my advisor said, well, why don't you keep doing it? You know, keep, keep up your French and do a, go abroad. And said, I'm never going to go abroad. I'm never going to uh, live in France. Uh, actually, I'm speaking to you from Paris, actually, right now. So, um, so that was a big mistake. I wish I had kept up my, my language, particularly uh, both for my, my practice and, and generally as well. I think it's always a good idea. So if we have that opportunity, I highly recommend that. Uh, and then when I arrived in, in Geneva, I, I uh, met a, um, a Swiss lawyer and he wanted to start a, a law practice. I had actually tried, applied for, uh, to get some jobs with the UN. Geneva is, the, is probably one of the biggest UN installations in the world. And you know, there's many, many different UN affiliated organizations plus NGOs. 
Um, but uh, that was not to be. Um, and, and, and it, in, in a strange twist of fate, most of my, my practice ended up being uh, representing international civil servants and suing um, these various international organizations. So now I'm, I became a partner with my, my uh, Swiss uh, lawyer friend, and, and I ended up uh, representing international civil servants sort of as an independent to people who worked at the UN, the ILO, the World Intellectual Property Office, and also representing a number of their the staff unions uh, in those organizations. And over time, I've, I've, uh, I've represented uh, whistleblowers, third, third parties injured by the UN. Uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, sue the UN. Uh, in U.S. courts, I've uh, argued before the Second Circuit Court of Appeal, challenging the constitutionality of uh, of the U of the UN's immunity, which prevents it from being generally being sued in in nas any national court, not just the U.S. Uh, I've brought uh, the UN to the several cases uh, against the UN and other international organizations to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, I've recently I, I uh, uh, submitted a, uh, an amicus brief with the uh, U.S. Supreme Court on behalf of. Um, Haitian plaintiffs who had been injured by UN peacekeepers who had, who had introduced cholera into Haiti, uh, and a number of them died, and, and they were seeking compensation. And of course, the cases unfortunately were dismissed because of the immunity. So, um, just very briefly, in terms of practicing uh, in Switzerland, I had an advantage um, because I um, I had a when I arrived here, I had a European. Union passport. I'm, I am also Irish. Uh, my grandfather was born in Ireland, so I was able to get an Irish passport. And that made it a bit easier. Although it, when I arrived in Switzerland in 1995, that they didn't have quite the same uh, exchanges of bilateral treaties with the European Union that made it easy for European Union's citizens to then work and, 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 and live in Switzerland. My, my degree, and, and Switzerland is a a civil code jurisdiction. And of course, you know, from America, we're in the common law system. Uh, had I been admitted in uh, another common law jurisdiction like the UK or Scotland or Ireland, and I actually considered doing that, um, and you could do it back then, you could do it by take, taking about three, three course, three exams, and then getting waived in if you were in good standing in a common law jurisdiction. They've changed that subsequently. But had I done that, I still I would then have been able to, to appear before the Swiss tribunals, even though I, I had only a common law background. Although my French will never be, in my view, will never be sufficient to plead in a French uh, uh, court. But uh, so my, my like the long and the short of it is definitely keep up the language. If you have a possibility to get another passport, uh, that certainly helps, um, and if it's a European Union passport, it's that you know it covers 28, uh, 27 countries plus several others like Switzerland, which is not part of the European Union. So uh, I don't, I don't want to go on much longer. I think the, I hopefully I hit some of the uh, the notes that Dan had wanted us to to speak of. But thank yeah. you. No, thanks, Edward. Uh, let's move on to Israel, Janet. How did right, you now we're going to go to something? But sorry, sorry, Dan. Uh -huh. How, how did you get from the hill to Israel? So I think now we're gonna to go to something a lot more standard and a lot less interesting. Um, but I wanna step back a year before I got to the hill in high school, I actually took an elective in international relations and just absolutely loved it. So I kind of had a bug in me before I got to the hill. And my freshman year toward the end is when they introduced international relations as a major and the requirements of the major have changed tremendous amount over the years. We were almost like a pilot program that Fletcher had written of what they thought would be good for students coming into Fletcher. So a whole bunch of us did it, but we were really the first year because of all the requirements that you could do a degree in international relations for people in my year, which was 1980. Um, of course, Fletcher didn't increase the amount of students that it took from Tufts. It only took one or two. So we all ended up with international relations and we couldn't go to Fletcher. Um, I spent a year in Israel after that. And then came back, went to Georgetown. So someone here did go to Georgetown for law. And I also got a master's there in what they call foreign service, which is just more international relations. So I was always very geared on the idea of doing international law. What happened is though, then you go to interview. And when you go to interview all these law firms that talk about international law on their websites, then they say, oh no, we don't do international law, it turns out, because they're talking about public international law, which is very hard to find which is why some of the people on the panel have my envy, because that is what they do. But private international law, or as someone told me, 
practicing English in like practicing law in broken English. That's private international law. That you can do all over the place. So I realized that was already an issue. I went to New York, Sherman and Sterling, a big international practice, and just wanted to go to an international office there. And I kept asking to go to any international office. Um, there was a lot of competition to get to those offices. I ended up being sent to our Tokyo office, which was pretty random. I had no background at all. Uh, I was there for almost two years. Amazing experience. So that's the easy way of doing it. That's the easiest way. You get sent by a foreign, by some U.S. law firm. So many of them have offices abroad. You get to go for just a couple of years. Um, they send you over. They pack you. They bring you back. They give you allowances. They help you with housing. Fantastic. If you can do that, that's the easiest way. When I was there, I started thinking, why don't I live in Israel? I always wanted to live in Israel. I went the first time when I was 10 years old. I always loved it. I kept going back. If I can work in a firm in Tokyo, well, maybe I can work in Israel. So I, um, I went over and I did something which is a great idea always, international um, informational interviews. You write to people, actually someone I know gave my resume to a whole bunch of law firms and um, that was through the larger corporate or commercial law firms in the country, most, almost all of which were in Tel Aviv. And I just wrote saying, I'm gonna be in Israel. I would love some informational interview with you as opposed to asking for a job. So you go in there and now there's no, anyone will do that, right? They'll always have coffee with you. And then I explained who I was and I came from Sherman and Sterling, big time New York firm. And in Israel, you have to do an internship, which is basically almost at no pay. It's a very, very low pay. It's gotten a little better, but at the time it was kind of ridiculous on the low pay. So why wouldn't they take someone with six years of corporate experience from New York and Tokyo and they're going to pay them the equivalent of like a thousand bucks a month. You know, what, what is the harm in that? Um, so I got too many offers during my international interviews. I knew there was a problem. Like it was a Woody Allen movie. There's clearly a problem here. Um, but I went to one that said that they thought they'd be the best choice for me. And that was Herzog Fox Neman. So I, uh, it took me a while to move back to New York, moved there, it took about a year. That's where I went. I've just hit 30 years here in the firm. The firm's grown from about 30 lawyers, or what we call B earners, because it includes interns, to over 400 B earners. It's the largest firm in Israel. The practice has grown since the day I got here. It never stopped growing. Uh, so that was sort of the easy way of doing it. Um, one thing, though, I so agree with the language issue. If you're going to work abroad, not having a local language is having your hands tied behind your back. You can do it, and your big strength and is, you know, you've got English. But if you really want to become a lawyer in a foreign jurisdiction, taking the leap, having some language ability and getting licensed in the local jurisdiction is kind of key to being a real lawyer there and not just an American practicing abroad. Great. That's awesome. So let's go further east, almost, I guess, to the other side of the world from Boston now is Geraldine, who's in Tokyo. Uh, it's 10 o'clock at night there. So uh, we've kept her up late. But so what I've heard so far from our first two panelists is we've had a bunch, uh, kind of a, a collection of serendipitous opportunities that kind of lead you from one place to another. Um, knowing to do some international uh, informational interviews, um, taking some risks. What's been your experience? Has has your path to Tokyo followed kind of that same trajectory? I think it's definitely, um, I've had similar experiences. Sometimes opportunities come up and you don't know where they're gonna be coming from. So I can tell you when I was at Tufts, I triple majored in IR, economics and Spanish. And I should give you the caveat that my family is actually Chilean. Um, so in one of my seminars, I wrote a paper on how Chile attracted foreign investments using its laws. And that basically opened my eyes to the role that law can play in fostering economic development. So that's when I decided to go to law school. So I chose a law school that had a strong international law program. And I started to look for jobs that where I could use my Spanish skills and my economics background. And that's when I discovered international investment law. Um, and then I also took advantage of, of studying abroad because American University had a study abroad program in Chile. So I took a class there on trade and investment. And then I also took, um, I also worked at a law firm which represented foreign investors in the mining field. And then after law school, I went to the commerce department. 
um, and I worked at the, gen at the general counsel's office where I did treaty negotiations. So I basically found the area that I liked where I was able to use Spanish. And then I worked in the government. And then I also worked in law firms um, representing foreign investors as well as states. And then an opportunity came again through my husband. He was offered a position in Singapore. So I ended up moving to Singapore. I was consulting um, for my law firm. And then I also started to look for other opportunities. And it was through friends of friends that told me that there was a center for international law that was starting up. They were looking at for people with investment law backgrounds. So I applied and I ended up taking the job there where I was focusing on ASEAN investment issues. And then when I moved back to DC, I worked, I started to work at ICSID and another position came up, I guess it was a year ago now to move to Tokyo. So I moved with my job at ICSID and now I'm based in Tokyo. So I think um, you just never know what can happen and you have to be flexible is what I've, I've learned. And I've also found you have to look for an area of law that's attractive in other jurisdictions. So that's one of the reasons that I liked international arbitration. Uh, I also agree that a foreign language is extremely important. So I had Spanish and I was a Latin America specialist. I am now learning Japanese and I don't know if I will be able to gain fluency in a year or two, but I'm trying. Um, and I also recommend to get a job before making the move, especially if you have to fund your own adventure. Um, and then the other, the other big tip I would have is, is job opportunities can come up unexpectedly from people that know your work, not necessarily from people in your own office. So always make sure that you make a good impression with people that you work with, including opposing counsel. And to take advantage if you if you do want to go do an LLM somewhere else, that's also helpful. But I do not think it's critical. If I could follow up with maybe uh, all three of our panelists on a couple of points that each of you have touched on, um, just brief questions. One, Tufts has a lot of great study abroad programs. So if you're a current student, would you recommend taking advantage of a study abroad program? 100%. 100%. I actually didn't do one through Tufts. I spent a semester in Israel. Surprisingly, I seem to have a trend going of where I kept going back to. But um, the the, uh, the fees in Israel were so cheap that I saved money spending a semester abroad, including airfare. Um, the Tufts programs abroad are amazing. In my particular year, junior year, a large percentage of the entire class, other than the engineering students, all went abroad. Senior year, we came back from all different countries with all different experiences. It was all across such an important thing to do on so many levels. I mean, I can say that's something I did not do and I wish I had done. I had actually been accepted to the program to go, it was the first year that they were going to Chile, um, but I fell in love with economics my junior year. So I ended up taking economics classes between my junior and senior year, which is very nerdy so that I could finish up with uh, the other, the third major but I, I would definitely recommend it. I also agree, and, and although I was not an exchange student, um, once I moved to, to Geneva, um, it's not very far from the Tufts European campus in Tawa, France. And my wife and I, and one of her work colleagues actually taught a, a class uh, one, some, one uh, spring semester, I guess, at, uh, through the experimental college at Tawa. It was, a, I think it was a seven or eight week program and we visited all the international organizations and so I, I, I absolutely if you have that opportunity both for the language aspect but also for the exposure I think it's a great idea. One of the things that I have found very helpful in my own experience has been the alumni network both the Tufts alumni network as well as my law school alumni network um, as well as professional associations um, especially the American Society of International Law which I got involved with um, through law school. I actually have found several jobs through alumni connections. What has been your experience in that regard? Have you found those to be helpful resources if only just for informational purposes or for actual job offers? I 
personally, I mean, I'd say informational only, not job offers. In, in Geneva, actually, there's not a Tufts alum uh, group, but there's a Fletcher alum a group. And uh, most of them are not lawyers. Most of them are more involved in the diplomatic world. But uh, so for me, it wasn't really about jobs, but it was more about uh, information and, and networking. I haven't used it and I wish I had, <laughs> and maybe I will in the future. Well, let's, why don't we turn to the second part of our talk and look at some of the experiences you've had with the, the challenges you've encountered, the surprises that you've had, um, as well as some of the opportunities that you think exist in, in the various fields, both the legal practice field and the geographic area that you're in. Um, this time, why don't I head west from the hill and start with Geraldine. Um, over in Tokyo. Sure. I mean, I think um, when I moved to Singapore, I was actually surprised because not a, there were very maybe two firms that had investment arbitration practices. And I had come from DC where it was prevalent. There were a lot of firms. So that, that was surprising to me. But I ended up um, taking a job in academia and at the Center for International Law where I worked. It was focused more on practice and promoting knowledge in the re region through seminars and training rather than writing like the typical theoretical papers. So it, it ended up being an amazing fit for me. So I think the number one thing I learned is to be flexible and be able to pivot and to remember that the, your career is long. You know, we end up having careers of 40 plus years. So to take a deviation, to be able to learn something different is also helpful. And I also took advantage and did an LLM, which I probably wouldn't have done otherwise. And then I guess yeah. I can tell you when I was in Chile, there was another more senior lawyer who was a, at, at a partner at a Canadian law firm. And he had moved there because he, he got married to a Chilean woman and he could not take the bar. He had to actually go to law school all over again. So five years of law school. So there are definitely some jurisdictions that have restrictions on who is allowed to take the bar and you know sometimes only lawyers from certain countries or specific law schools can take the bar so that's something to consider but there are other areas like international arbitration where you can practice without necessarily being barred in the foreign jurisdiction and I can play on that for just a moment I know Edward mentioned he's Irish and it's very valuable to have an EU passport um, another option is the Commonwealth. If you have any into the United Kingdom or Canada or one of the nations in the Commonwealth, including Australia and New Zealand, um, I believe, if I remember correctly from when I looked into it, that if you are admitted to one of those, that opens up the doors to those other jurisdictions. Uh, and that's another large grouping of countries which will enable you to practice with at least some more limited um, uh, requirements to get in, I, if I remember correctly. So don't quote me on that, please. Um, I mean, I, I, I can tell you from my experience in Singapore, even though they may not have been able to practice um, before the courts, it's easier to get jobs um, as a UK lawyer, as, a, as an Australian lawyer, because of the Commonwealth. Right. And you at the very least have the right to go into the country and and be there and work there, it, or that's something to consider and look at um, because I, I know- mean, I mean, it depends, it depends on the country, I think, right, yeah. Right, 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 that's the key. Janet, do you wanna talk a little bit about what, what challenges you've encountered and, and opportunities you um, have found over in Israel? Uh, sure, I think I wanna start by saying, I think there are no rules and everyone should remember that our experiences are always anecdotal and there's no there's the best way and the easiest way and then there's your way so i'll tell you that when you want to come to another country and work let's say in israel first of all your competitive advantage is english if you're a native english speaker international business is conducted in english sometimes even there will be contracts between a buyer and a seller in a certain jurisdiction where because of, let's say it was a tender, in the end of the day, I remember hearing this, a French company is selling to a French company, but it was a tender, so all the, doc the documentation is going to be in English anyway. I mean, in the world of international business is so heavily uh, English influenced. This isn't to say that, let's say, if you go to China, they're not going to want documents in China. There's exceptions, but it gives you a huge advantage when you bring that in on such a high level. Um, and that gives you your, your big advantage going in. So I can tell you the easiest way to get abroad 
is to go to some big, terrific law firm uh, in a major jurisdiction, work in corporate law for two to four years, five years, get trained there, and then your services in international business are going to be the easier to pick up. You're a mid-level associate. Everyone will want you. That's great if that's what you do. If that's not what you want to do, that's not what you're, you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it just to get a job. So I'm giving you the, that's the easiest route. And by the way, it's still not easy. It's still a transition, moving countries, whatever, trying to go to different places, checking work permits, whatever. But that's going to be the smoothest transition you're going to have. I have an amazing partner in my office who's American, who was a litigator for five years, came over and had to learn corporate work. Took her a couple, a year or two, whatever, to get the hang of it. She's amazing. So it's not that you have to have been a corporate lawyer coming over. Um, employment law, very, very local. But if you love employment law and you did it in one jurisdiction, you can probably figure it out in another jurisdiction without too much of a learning curve, You know, getting that down pretty quickly. So don't worry too much about the rules. If you know you want to live in a foreign country, and I just said two to four years, corporate experience, really important, but you want to go right away, right out of law school, just do it. You don't go and take a job for a couple of years hoping that it'll lead to the job you really want because life is going to happen. You know, life is going to happen. You've got, I don't know, debts or a mortgage or a, or a spouse or a dog or whatever, and you may never end up doing the dream. So the dream should always be put out first. I mean, I think in terms of language, in, in terms of um, obstacles or challenges, local law, local language. Obviously, if you don't know that, again, hands tied behind your back when you're trying to work there. So that's a challenge, but it's an opportunity because a lot of us who go to law school or other places just want to keep learning as we go along during our career. We're never tired of learning. So yeah, you're going to have to keep learning. And that would be true anyway. Uh, there's always a cultural difference wherever you go, but you know you deal with that and. Again, if, if, you're, if you're an American, you kind of come in with your own view of your culture being somewhat superior, at least that's what you used to think. And the world may not accept you that way, but at least it's a thing coming in. So you think I'm a cultured person, but you can learn to another culture, adjust to another culture, see what the differences are, be flexible, be open. You probably are anyway, if you weren't really flexible and open and want to learn and embrace other cultures, you wouldn't want to go abroad anyway. So that should be a pretty easy one. Um, and again, you want to make the move. Eventually, it's taking the bar in a local jurisdiction. Eventually, there's no rush, there are no rules, and there's no failure. You go abroad for a year or two, it worked great. You come home, fine. Don't put pressure on yourself. Just go for the journey and see where it leads you. Yeah, Janet, I can, I can definitely attest to the fact that I think it's easier as a corporate lawyer to go abroad than it is as a litigator, which is what my background is um, in litigation. Uh, you can be an international litigator. And I think, Edward, you'll talk to some more about that. There's opportunity for that. But as a, a litigator who's used to litigating in U.S. tribunals, it is a very difficult move um, to, to find an opportunity abroad because you really then have to be, I think, admitted to the local jurisdiction. Um, although there are ways to practice U.S. law abroad and you get uh, there are basically a foreign foreign legal consultant or foreign lawyer status. Um, every jurisdiction has a bit of a different name for it, um, but there is that opportunity as well. Again, I think you you generally have to be with a law firm. I think, um, like you said, like like Geraldine said, uh, that's probably the easiest way to do that. Um, Edward, what do you think about it? What's been your experience having moved abroad, kind of serendipitously? What what challenges have you encountered? Well, certainly what um, Janet and, and Geraldine have, have, and you have touched on is, 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 is quite, can be big issues. And, and I agree, um, Switzerland has a similar uh, legal practitioner, legal consultant, whereas as long as you're not holding yourself out as a, a Swiss lawyer uh, and you have a qualification in another law, you can set up a consultancy. You still have to deal with the other um, permit issues uh, and then and language. Um, just two two things that I'll I'll, I'll mention. One is, um, in in terms of go you know finding a, a litigation job, many of the international organizations, the UN, um, some of the the inter, the International Criminal Court, some of the, the war crimes tribunal uh, tribunals, um, you can in fact uh, litigate there. Again, it's international litigation. It's 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 not and it's it's more public international law more than, than private law. Um, I'm not a big fan uh, since I litigate on behalf of employees of the international organizations against them. Um, uh, I, I, 
I could do a whole nother talk about that. Uh, I'll just say, but that th there's an opportunity there. Um, and, you know, in Geneva, the World Intellectual Property Office is here, the, the, the World Trade Organization, uh, the International Telecommunications Unit, a union, which, again, they, they have loads of lawyers. I've represented many, many lawyers over my, my career who had worked for these international organizations. So that's another that's another avenue where and, and when you do that, you still have the, the, the language issue. Generally, now you have to speak. Uh, usually you have to speak two of the of the, the, the languages of the organization, generally French and English. Um, the, but then you won't have the permit issue so much. So you can at least get into uh, the country, wherever the, the, the organization is and, and practice um, for the company. And then and in, I've, in Geneva, there's many, many people who, who had worked for international organizations uh, and left. And some went and are, are doing trade work for some some American firms that have satellite offices here. Others have opened up boutique uh, firms. Uh, again, each, each jurisdiction is different. In my own practice as well, I did find, although my, my practice became somewhat focused on you know, employment law, whistleblowers, international organizations, but by virtue of the fact that I'm an American lawyer, people would, would seek me out for all kinds of different cases. As a result, I'm now involved in a, a mass tort claim in, in Africa. Uh, which we hope to eventually bring uh, to, to be litigated in the U.S. Um, I've, I did a number of wills uh, for Americans who were living here when I first arrived. Um, many the, for, there are many different opportunities. What I also noticed is there's quite a difference between the American legal training, and, and at least I can only speak to the European continental uh, approach, which the, the continental lawyers view themselves as a bit more um, independent from their clients, whereas as American lawyers, you know, uh, our, our ethical obligation is to represent our clients zealously. And, and people come and, and say, you know, uh, I want to retain you because you're an American lawyer. So well, why? I mean, I, you know, oh, because you're going to fight for me. And, and, and that seems to be whether that's true or not. Uh, I think it is true on the other side that the, 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 the continental lawyers, are a bit more removed from their clients than American lawyers tend to be. And, and, and tend to be the American lawyers, you know, our focus is the client. Whereas I find in my partners and, and other Swiss lawyers I've come to know, it's, it's not always the case. They're always, they, it's almost like they have two masters, which, you know, as an American lawyer is a, you know, that's, that's a no, no. Um, so I, I find the opportunities continue to present themselves just by, by virtue of you being able to, 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 to be here, whether you're practicing in a, in a company or, or in a firm, or if you're able to eventually start your own practice. So. I want to pick up on something that Janet had mentioned, and I think Edward, you might have had this experience as well with um, interning. So one of the ways to get into a lot of places is to intern, especially an international organization. But Janet, like you mentioned, internships are required in Israel. Uh, I think traineeships in the UK. Um, you know, how do you do that if you don't have funding? If you don't have some sort of stipend or scholarship or something to that effect, um, what would you recommend to someone who would love to go abroad and offer their services or even just to New York, right? To go intern at the UN headquarters in New York, but living in New York is quite expensive these days. Um, I know that schools, I think especially law schools are starting to do more public interest funding, but what would you recommend to someone? Um, would you recommend that they uh, try and find some side job or or how or is it worth taking out a loan uh, to fund such an opportunity? What would be your recommendation on that? Don't scare me. Um, I'm not sure I went, but I, I agree with you. First of all, when I studied an internship in, in Israel, that was the requirement for the bar is that they have, yeah, every, every lawyer has to do an internship. They call it stage, which is based off the French system. So it's a little bit different, but again, the pay was very, very low at the time. It's still pretty low, but um, but I did have another job as an internship when I was doing a year between law school and um, between college and law school, and I really wanted a meaningful job in international relations because that was my undergraduate, and I wanted to spend a year in Israel doing something meaningful. And I tried like so naively to get a job, and I was getting nowhere. And it was like two weeks before my flight, and I happened to run into someone, and he worked in a research center, and he said, you know, is it are you willing to do volunteer or not volunteer? And I said either because I was so desperate. He said, come work for me. So I got an amazing job at a research center. 
it wasn't paid, what I did is I did it part time. I just did it a couple of days a week. And then the other few days of the week, I tried to get a job in a bar or something kind of ridiculous. Um, and eventually they hired me full time where I was. So instead of doing this volunteer work in a place that wasn't even really set up for it, they just hired me part time on sort of a student basis, minimum wage kind of thing. Uh, I think at the time in dollars, I was making an eight, a dollar eighty five an hour, but whatever. At least it was something. Um, so if you can do something, if you can find it, because it's true, if you can afford an internship, we don't get paid. You're just so much ahead of the class. And that's so unfair. So what's a good way to do it? Try to get an internship, which is just one or two days a week and try to get, get something, even if you're you know, making coffee, to, to fund that. The other thing you can do is just keep looking for grants and stipends and things that might be available to you because of where you live, where you're going, your, your organization with whatever your affiliation with, who knows, whether it's religion, a church, whatever, whatever it takes to see if there's anything out there, you know, just keep Google research and see if you can get anything to help you. Another thing to do is reach out to the communities. If you have some kind of connection, any affiliation to see if someone's willing to put you up. I've just heard of someone who got an offer in some community because it's too low paying for them to afford the rent. Somebody has a free, whatever, a free house and is willing to put up a couple of these student interns while they're not there for free for semester, which is amazing. So just, be creative to try to work out something to pull it together. Geneva's well is, is known for its uh, abuse of uh, internships, uh, and it's also a very high cost uh, place. One of the one of the things that's possible both in in Switzerland and, and I think in in some European Union countries is that if you if you enroll in a, a graduate program or even an undergraduate, but generally a graduate program. It does allow you uh, to work a certain uh, hours, number of hours a week. So that's one way to get it, particularly in Switzerland. That's how many people get around, and they, they you know, they they're studying a bit, they're working a bit, and then they're, you know, they're doing the internship for free. Um, but it, again, it's hard, um, you know, particularly in places like New York or Geneva or Paris, or you know, where, where the cost of living is so high. But uh, it, it, if you can even do it for six months. You, I, I think the contacts you make are, are, are uh, priceless and, and well worth it, and, and probably would lead to something more. And again, if you if you're able to deal with the, the, the permit issues and the language, then you're you're that much further ahead. You may also be getting course credit for wherever you're enrolled, in which case it's saving you because you're not paying for a number of courses that you'd be taking otherwise. You look at it that way too. Tom, why don't we open up the floor to questions? Yeah. So one thing that has come up in, in the questions, including one parent of a current freshman at Tufts is if, um, if you know that you really do want to start and have a international law practice um, right out of college, you know, to start that as, oppo as opposed to take the path that Janet suggested where you, you know, go to a law school in the United States and, and work for a large firm that, that will take you into international. What, what are the options there? Um, to to just really start your career out on an international basis and then also if you could somebody could talk about LL, llms and whether you know in the us or um in foreign jurisdictions what what benefit that gives to to uh applicants looking for a job including current i think we have one employment attorney that asked that question um that's a u.s employment attorney looking to go abroad Well, I guess I can pipe in. So I think there are some programs like there are JD LLM programs that some US universities offer that, are, you know, with a foreign university. I think uh, Cornell has one with the Sorbonne, AU has one with like five or six other countries. So that's one option. And then you can use that to propel yourself into the other jurisdiction. Um, and with respect to LLMs, you can also do, I think NYU and NUS had an LLM where you can get two LLMs at both universities. I actually ended up just doing the LLM at NUS and it was much cheaper. It was like a 10th of the price. So I think that's helpful because if there are visa restrictions, you can actually get into the country that way and then find a job. And I would, I would say you should find a job while you're there at, doing the LLM or right afterwards. 
And I can but also I, add, sorry, yeah. go ahead, Jeremy. No, I, I just, but I don't know if um, it's necessary to have an LLM, but I think it, it can hurt and it's useful. I, I can't speak to the necessary part. I think that's jurisdiction specific. Typically they look for some sort of local qualification, um, but with respect to the LLM, um, coming from a U.S. school, I went to Duke, and Duke offers both a JD and an LLM in international comparative law, and it's a, it's a joint degree. You do it in three and a half years, and I can tell you that that LLM is not worth anything from an international perspective in my experience, so I, I like the sound of the programs that you were just describing where you're getting your LLM from the foreign institution. I think that will have a lot more value than an LLM from a U.S. institution, whether it's Duke or whether it's another uh, U.S. law school. I mean, I guess one benefit of an LLM would be to change focus if you wanted to do a different, like an LLM in tax, you know, if you had been practicing just straight litigation. Um, and I can tell you from the Singapore perspective, an LLM from NUS will not enable you to take the bar. There are certain there, there, it's very restrictive. So it, it would depend on the jurisdiction. I actually happen to know probably about 10 or 15 Swiss lawyers, qualified Swiss lawyers who did an LLM in New York. And at the end of that period took the, the New York bar and passed, which, you know, given that the New York bar is probably the first or second most difficult bar in the US, I find it mind boggling, uh, although no one would admit it, I, you know, I guess the fix is in, if you, if you will. Um, and, and, you know, most of them don't practice uh, American law, but it, you know, they, they put the LLM and then their New York bar on their letterhead, but you can, it, it's not reciprocal. You can't, you know, getting as, as Geraldine said uh, in Singapore here, if you take, get an LLM, you still can't take the bar. You really have to go to a Swiss law school uh, and, 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 and then do the, the stage that uh, Janet was talking about, similar two years at slave wages. And, and um, it, it's, it's, uh, it, but it's an undergraduate degree. I mean, that's the only other advantage in, in, in Europe. Uh, many of the law programs are undergraduate degrees. They're not graduate degrees. So, uh, you know, it's something that, uh, uh, that's another way. I, I, obviously, uh, the, 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 the question from the parent, uh, the, the student is already at Tufts, but, um, you know, for others, perhaps that's an, an opportunity, but uh, uh, it's, it's more difficult. What's the market like with uh, in-house counsel positions for, you know, international companies? Are, is there a market for wanting to hire uh, law, law graduates, you know, one or two years out after, pra after practice or, or, or not? I know that domestically, um, legal departments have grown quite a bit over the past, you know, 10 years. And I don't know if that same trend is happening internationally. For some companies, let's say U.S. public companies that may have subsidiaries abroad and it's connected to a public company, there may be more of a, of a need for that um, because they may have to know something about securities law. They may have to help with filings that are going on in the U.S. If a company is completely domestic in some foreign jurisdiction and you come in, again, maybe you have some commercial experience. You can help with commercial contracts. You don't know the local law. And an in-house position, you are the one that people just keep stopping in your door down the hall asking you questions about local law that you're not going to know. So it can be a little tricky. Um, and it's also, depending on the jurisdiction, may not end up with a way for you to become licensed in that jurisdiction. But it, I mean, again, you can try to look into it. I think it's maybe a little bit harder to do. I see less opportunities for the, the one to two year uh, experienced lawyers. Um, there are a lot of multinational companies in Geneva that uh, I've, you know, they have a number of, of international lawyers, but they, they came, corporate lawyers, but they came after they had uh, a fair amount of experience. So uh, I think it's, it's a bit more difficult, uh, uh, at least in, 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 in my experience. In that situation, you don't have to be admitted to the local bar if you're working in-house. So that's one no. barrier you don't have to deal with. Exactly. Um, so just to change the topic a little bit, you know, we've been in the pandemic for the past 18 months or however long it's been, um, and that's impacted um, international travel. Um, it's impacted, you know, how we all communicate with each other. But also from the, from the students' perspective, they weren't able to do the study abroad that, you, that some of you really found to be valuable. Um, I guess just, you know, 
Edward, if you could just share kind of from your perspective, you know, what impacts COVID, you know, has happened over the past year and a half and, and, you know, would you, what would you recommend a tough student to do right now if they wanted to have the a broad experience, but, you know, can't necessarily do it in their four years of um, time at Tufts? Yeah, no, I, it's, it's, it's for, for so many people, it's been a tough experience. I mean, I, I, I actually have three passports. I have an American, Swiss, and Irish. So I've actually been quite fortunate over the past 18 months. I've been able to travel, I mean, at least between the U.S. and, and, and mostly through Europe without any, any real restriction. Um, but to answer your question, Tom, I think, and perhaps, uh, you know, when I was uh, a student, I went directly from, from the Hill to, to law school. It was a financial uh, requirement for me. But I know that many uh, students today, they do take a gap year. I mean, you know, my son, who's now in law school in Switzerland, uh, took a gap year uh, between high school and, and, and going into law school as an undergraduate. Um, I, I would absolutely recommend that if that's a possibility. One, you know, where you're not necessarily doing something on a professional basis you just if you're able to work get some experience you know even if you're working on a beach somewhere in a foreign country to see if you uh, for many of the issues that that Janet and Geraldine also touched on the cultural stuff the language uh you know that's I think that's very important you have thoughts on on that Janet you're making contacts when you go live in a place. You're deciding whether or not you actually want to be there, and you're demonstrating some sort of seriousness if you ever apply for a job there. If I get an applicant for a job and someone who's never stepped foot in this country, there's no way I want to try to take the risk of bringing them over to a place they've never been. So it, it's it's the same thing, I think, that Geraldine was saying, that when you're doing an LMN, that's the time to look for a job in the country if you're doing it in a foreign country, because you're there, you can meet people in person, et cetera. Um, I, Personally, I think for your own general development, if you weren't able to travel during your time at Tufts and you really want to do it and you can afford to try to find just some kind of job, some kind of travel experience, yeah, get out of the country, see other things. It's an amazing opportunity. It will always benefit you, however you're able to do it. So there's been some questions about uh, Fletcher. Janet, you mentioned Fletcher when you were at Tufts. Um, do any of the panelists have any thoughts or impressions on on the relationship between Fletcher and Tufts and and international uh, law practice and diplomacy? When, when I was an undergraduate, my uh, my advisor was actually a Fletcher professor uh, because I was part of the, the, the bulge class of 77. So they had to bring in some Fletcher professors to be her advisors. But um, I, I think for those who are interested in working in international organizations, um, you know, the, the, the Fletcher connection, I think, is probably very useful. Um, you may not necessarily be uh, practicing law, uh, but again, the contacts you're working overseas are, are you know, you're meeting, a, there are a lot more foreign students probably at, at uh, Fletcher programs than there are necessarily at the undergraduate program. So, uh, and certainly, as I said before, in Geneva, the, the Fletcher alum uh, group is, is, uh, is quite active and quite big. Uh, and most of them are probably non American uh, as well. If I can, if I can follow up on that, um, you know, I'd mentioned alumni networks before, and certainly Fletcher is a great one for Tufts. Um, uh, um, but beyond that, you have professional associations you can re reach out to, but then also, and what some of the other panelists have said, just take a, a safe risk, you know, just be creative and do research. If you find someone who has a really awesome sounding position, just reach out to them, send them an email. That's the great thing about email is that it costs nothing. And the worst that happens is they don't respond. So um, I think that the networks you have through Tufts and your law school and other things are great. And I certainly recommend to everyone to take advantage of those. Um, but at the end of the day, there's nothing stopping you from reaching out to any random person you can find their email address, their contact information online, and just ask for you know a short phone call. Um, the great thing is with WhatsApp and iMessage and, and FaceTime and everything else now, Skype, we can talk to anyone literally around the world. And so you can reach out, and I have. I've reached out to the general counsel of international organizations before who I had no connection to. Just say, hey, I'm interested in working in this area 
would you mind speaking to me for a few minutes about what things that I could do? Are there opportunities there? How I can better my application? Um, and they usually say yes. So that's certainly my advice to, to people. Um, be creative and, and use your networks, but don't be afraid of going outside of it either. People like to talk about themselves and their jobs. When you get in touch with someone and say, I'm really interested in what you're doing. Will you talk to me for a minute? I'm just a student, whatever. They, they tend to love it. So I guess bringing it back uh, full circle, I'd like to you know hear from each of you um, on your experiences at Tufts um, and you know what helps your perhaps practice now or internationally or what do you look back on and wish you could do more of um, while, while, when you were at Tufts. Um, Geraldine, you wanna go first? Sure, I had, I had a wonderful experience at Tufts. The courses that I took were amazing. I also had most of my friends were international. So I think that's helped me a lot in my career as well. You know, they were from all over the world, from Venezuela, from Argentina, from everywhere. So it's, you know, when I started to do international arbitration, I was already familiar with those cultures, which was very useful, as well as the Spanish and the economics and all that. Yeah, three majors is uh, quite an accomplishment. Uh, Edward. Um, I, I actually ran the student pub for the, the last two years th that I was uh, there, and I wish I'd um, spent more time on my, my studies and less time earning money to pay for Tufts. But uh, in the end, I'm very happy about that. And, and uh, it, it actually, it, it, you know, the relationship between managing the, the student pub and becoming a lawyer is not so evident, but it was because I was a fairly shy uh, person. I hated public speaking. Uh, and in, just in that position, I, it, I was sort of forced into doing more public speaking uh, and, and, and managing. I mean, that's, you know, that's true of any, it's not just lawyers, it's any, any job you have. But uh, for me, that was a, a fabulous experience. Thanks, Edward. And Janet? Um, oh, that's great. I worked in the library as like a student, you know, checking out books in the library. And then I also worked in the dining room and social and the services like staffing and stuff. But on the way home, I always, always, always went to the pub. So I'm sure I told you that. <laughs> because we were there at the same time. Um, I also had a ton of international friends from the first dorm I was in at Tufts my freshman year, and I'm sure that also helped on the trajectory that I have today of that being what always interests it does the most, meeting people from all over the place and having friends from all over. Um, I just think the general curiosity, it's also very important, I always say, because I did a lot of alumni interviewing for Tufts over the years, if you're in Tufts now, get out of Somerville and Medford and get into Boston, take advantage of Boston. People don't do that enough. Um, they spend way too long, you know, going to Boston maybe once a year instead of spending some time there. So you can take advantage of that and, um, and enjoy the ability of still being in a liberal arts environment where you can dabble and explore what you like in all different things. Because when you start getting into law school and certainly have your job, you don't have a lot of time and you have to get much more focused. So uh, this is the time to really get that liberal arts view to be as well-rounded and open and patient and, and get your morals in the right place before you go out to the real world. That's great, Janet, thank you. And uh, Dan, you wanna, wanna close it out and give your experience and your recommendations? I agree with everything that, uh, that, that our three panelists have said. I think take advantage of opportunities that present themselves as long as they're safe risks what I'll, is what I'll say you know be responsible about it but take advantage of it if you can find a way to do it and if it means enabling yourself to go abroad that is just priceless that opportunity and if you can't get out of uh, campus can't go abroad there you know, you have, I don't know how many countries represented right there on campus. So use your resources there. And then don't be afraid of using technology that we have available to ourselves to, to us now. Um, again, we have people joining us literally from every part of uh, the world right now. And we, we have no problem communicating with each other. Technology is this amazing thing we can use. So don't be afraid to use it. Um, and I think uh, with that, we've reached the end of our hour, and I don't want to get in trouble with the, uh, the IT people. Um, so I want to thank our panelists for joining us, um, for taking time out of their busy schedules, and for staying up later. 
than they probably would otherwise. Um, and I will hand it off to Tom for uh, closing to do's. Yeah, and no, I just want to say thank you uh, to Dan, the, the panelists. I, I learned a lot, but love meeting you all. And and um, what's great about Tufts is we do have a strong international presence. And with the Tufts Lawyers Association, we're looking to expand our reach to engage with this membership of, of our of our uh, of our group. So wonderful program. And and um, stay. Uh, Amy put in the chat room all the uh, upcoming programs. So please register for those. And we'll see you uh, soon. Thank you. All right. Take care, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.